Alright all you glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 Podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcast, that really, really means a lot to us. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show, and you'd be really helping us out. And thank you so much to anyone who's already done that. You're an absolute legend to us. Thank you. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, Mr. Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? It's going pretty well, Mark. It's dark and dreary here in Glasgow. It really is. It's got very cold recently. <laughs> it's very, very cold. I'm wearing two layers. This is unprecedented. Yeah, it's uh, it's nippy in the old studio here. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, how you doing? I am okay. Yeah. But I want to talk about some video games, Lewis. Good stuff. I know that you've been playing Death Stranding. I know that you've been playing The Outer Worlds. But what I want to talk about is a game that came out over a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Borderlands 3. Yeah. Me and you have started playing Borderlands 3 co-op. We have indeed, yeah. Um, so this is my first ever Borderlands experience. Basically every week after we record the show, we play something together. And we've been playing Super Metroid for weeks and weeks and weeks. Finally put that to bed, which was incredible. I'm not sure if we've spoken Absolutely much about it. Absolutely superb here. game. Yeah. I mean, I know that Super Metroid is literally one of the best games ever made. <laughs> and is widely regarded as such. Yeah. So us saying good game is good. It yeah. really isn't much use, but it really is. <laughs> it was superb, and yeah, just like well before our time, kind of thing. So it was great to go back and play that. But finally, yeah, my first ever Borderlands experience. I've never played any of the other games. I really wasn't sort of looking forward to this particularly. I, I was willing to play it because any game that still has a couch co op, particularly a couch co op story mode, I am desperate to try and give support to. But nothing about Borderlands has ever really appealed to me. I don't like first person shooters very much at all. But I've got to say, like, I, re- I really enjoy enjoyed it it's got just terrible dialogue and and i couldn't (laughs) care less about the story at all the visuals are kind of what they are like it's not necessarily something i love but like i I quite like the visuals it's like borderline games yeah it's like doing its thing and that's fine like i'm on board with it as far as that but yeah like in terms of just the actual gunplay and the adventure around this kind of like i just i know fun is a really undescriptive word to use for this kind of thing but i just thought it was kind of like mindless good fun trying out different weapons running about daft having a good old shoot with you we don't get to play a lot of couch co-ops anymore quite frankly because there aren't that many make them no they do not i've always been quite a big fan of borderlands well ever since borderlands 2 i never really played one much but i played borderlands 2 loads and in actual fact it was the reason i bought an xbox 360 right at the end of that oh, generation yeah, yeah, right, yeah. was basically to play uh borderlands 2 with my friends um i love the all the randomized guns and whatever the story of it is equally cheesy and nonsense and daft and co- again good fun yeah you know what have you been playing well Lewis, i have been playing pokemon Yes. Here we go. <laughs> yes. I should start out by saying I've not played a lot of this game, really. I've played maybe maybe about the first two or three hours. It is absolutely categorically a Pokemon game. It is 100% what I was expecting, <laughs> and I am very happy with that. There seemed to be a, a lot of chat around the fact that this game didn't look good. It looks fantastic. You, you'd go as far as fantastic. I think it looks great. Well, yeah. it looks as good. It looks as good as Let's Go, which mm. I thought looked great for that kind of world for what that it is. Were, yeah, yeah. That they were making. I think that actually they're doing a bit more with the camera, although it's still fixed camera angles, which is a bit annoying in general. But they are they've kind of brought the camera down, and it's more panning across uh, landscapes. So you're getting to see more of the world, whereas in Let's Go, it was much more traditional, kind of more above you than down beside you. Yeah. So they're doing like more interesting things with that, and they're they're kind of pointing out things in the distance, and you can see just kind of like rolling hills and whatever, and you've never really seen that properly in a Pokemon game before, although it was always kind of animated that these things were kind of there. You mm-hmm. never really got to see things off in the distance. So I quite like that. I think that the game, again, looks every bit as good as Let's Go. I don't think that this game has to look better than Let's Go. It is completely perfect for what it's trying to be. Aye, one thing I will say about Let's Go is that I like that they've included the roaming Pokemon in it. Like, so in the tall grass, Mm -hmm. it's not just random encounters. And in actual fact, random encounters can be kind of dodged as well. Oh, really? Good. But as well as that, you can see the Pokemon roaming around that you can go and either capture or try and avoid if you wanted it to because i know that that was a bugbear of yours that you just don't like random encounters <laughs> absolutely like it's very cheating to know that you don't have to necessarily go through that in the new game that feels like such an outdated mechanic to me well you're going to love final fantasy 7 <laughs> i can tell you that yeah one thing i will say about it looking good is that the problems 
with a lot of the textures and whatever and when people were pointing out oh this actually doesn't look that great was in the wild area mm -hmm. which is the big open area yep. and where people were having like problems with like pretty bad popping again i think that was in the wild area i've not got to that bit yet so i can't comment on go, that go. so perhaps when i get there i'll be like oh now we're starting to see the problems mm -hmm. and the general just going from town to town and the, everything's looked perfectly great Nice. Perfectly right. Well, that's good. Yeah. Are you playing handheld or docked? I have so far only played docked, but this is the beauty of the Switchless, yeah. is that I can do both. And I will be playing it on trains. Yeah, it'll be great. It'll be awesome. I'm very I'm very excited to have a Pokemon game again in my life. So let me do like just probe into that very quickly. You've said it's categorically 100% a Pokemon game. Does it feel new in any way? Does it just yeah. feel like you're playing an old the game? The Pokemon feel new. Yeah. Everything that I've ran into basically has been... Not, well, that's not entirely true. But a lot of what I've run into has been new Pokemon. Mm -hmm. And I think that the designs of the new Pokemon, which I thought were getting a bit ludicrous for <laughs> quite a long period of time, almost everything that I've ran into have been like, oh, that's quite cool. Yeah. Including the starters. Like, I think all the starters look quite cool. Whereas in generations past, I think that some of them have been a bit so-so or there's been like a clear winner. Right. But this time around, I feel as if all three of them look pretty good. Mm. And I th from what I've been able to find out, just kind of looking on social media and whatever, it seems that there's been no one that's the clear favourite. I think Score Bunny's probably, probably is the favourite, just yeah, because it's yeah, the fire one. Yeah. But this is the first game that I never chose the fire starter. I chose Grookey, which is the grass starter, which was always my last choice nice, in basically yeah. every other game. See, uh, I, I was a Bulbasaur boy back in the day. I know you were yeah. a Bulbasaur boy. You were the only Bulbasaur boy I knew, though. Everyone I was chose, the head of everyone the curve, man. chose Charmander. <laughs> I knew Charmander was amazing, and Charizard was amazing. <laughs> I just knew that 20 years later, Later, you know, <laughs> grass type would be the boy so. playing the long game like, yeah he's a little grass monkey dude and yeah. he's awesome and yeah so that's why that's so why there, I them. there is no immediate disadvantage then because that i remember from blue and red and those are the last ones that there's I no immediate disadvantage like and i've not got to any of the gyms yet so right. it's hard for me to tell that cool. so for example what you're getting at is in like gen one choosing the fire pokemon was actually like playing on hard because the first gym battle that you had to do was, was rock, rock which yeah. it was a week against yeah. and then after that not very long after that i can't remember if it was the gym immediately after that or the one after that was water Mm -hmm. and that was it was also weak to that so it never got good until like much later on in the game but i don't i don't know yet is the is the short answer cool. to that i suppose i'll make sure to ask you that again next week cool. <laughs> well that's the thing is that i i don't have i don't actually have a huge amount to say about it yet mm -hmm. because i haven't put that amount of time into it but my initial first impressions are almost entirely positive good, good. is it totally cheesy childish dialogue yes were they all yes is it great absolutely <laughs> it's fucking awesome like it's just a pokemon game it, at its heart and soul, it is a pure Pokemon game, and it's the next proper one. None of this watered down, let's go nonsense. Would you like in the end anyway, right? Which I did like <laughs> in the end because I like them all. <laughs> well, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's great. I thoroughly enjoy it. I think the score of like, what was it? I sitting on kind of mid to eight yeah yeah eight totally to fine eight. Yeah. totally fine well good i'm really glad for you because like yeah you've been looking forward to it it could have been a total flop and a disaster with the way that the fans were talking about it in advance so good stuff like i'm really excited to hear more about it i'll probably never touch it myself but i want to <laughs> i want to see a bit at least like maybe when we're done here i could like see five minutes of Yo, man, whatever, definitely yeah. definitely uh, good stuff okay then on to the news all right and news item number one XO19 has happened in London, Lewis. Maybe not the blockbuster announcements that we were expecting, or maybe not expecting, maybe expecting is a strong word, but <laughs> they were bigging it up in a way I was maybe expecting a Halo announcement and we're just going to be straight out and say <laughs> <Yeah. it. laughs> I was expecting something from Halo, but that was yeah. not to be. However, there were announcements. Uh, just starting out with the kind of main ones, I suppose. First off, Grounded, the new Obsidian game. Obsidian, of course, famous for the original Fallouts and the Outer Worlds, which we have not stopped gushing about <laughs> for about four weeks now. Uh, yeah, this is their next game where you play as, it seems to be a group of children mm -hmm. that has been shrunk down, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids yeah. style. This is Honey, to, I Shrunk the Kids. It's, the game. it's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the game, yes. Uh, down to about a centimeter it seems to be and you have to survive in your back garden yes yeah, effectively sort of suburban back garden with all the trappings that that would have so yeah so this is coming out in spring 2020 thoughts I th it looks all right yeah it's hard to know i mean it seems to be basically like a sandbox survival type game yeah i can i can live without more survival mechanics in games but like i think it looks really nice it's got a kind of summer's day vibe about it everything looks n nice and fresh but then there's like spiders and dirty old ants and guys like that down there where the kind of combat starts to come in this is essentially just like a short little cinematic trailer like it's an interest it's a nice concept yeah. at least they, they did show gameplay yeah yeah there's gameplay within it yeah but it's like largely just kind of setting up like yeah, yeah. what the world is yeah whatever, there's yeah. not there's not too much no. 
nah, the rides nah. from the trailer. I, I will give you that. However, I I often associate Obsidian with like heavy RPGs. Oh, oh, absolutely, yeah. This is not that. It doesn't seem. Doesn't so seem this, this is quite a departure from mm-hmm. them, I would say. And it also looks like a much smaller title. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Like I'm not getting any strong feelings about it. Whereas if they had announced, oh yeah, Outer Worlds 2 is definitely coming to Xbox, I would be like, oh, well, I'm going to have to buy an Xbox at some point. <laughs> and that's the end of that. Whereas this, I'm just kind of like, okay. I mean, presumably this is just like a splinter from the main team because they must have been working on the Outer Worlds until very recently and probably still patching that and things like that. Yeah, so, so there was actually an interview on Game Informer where they had spoke to the team just as the Outer Worlds was coming out about this. Oh, right. And so it seems to have been going on concurrently. I'm not sure that maybe maybe this kicked off when Xbox purchased yeah. the studio. Yeah, maybe. I don't know, maybe Xbox just made funding available to, for them to start working on a game for them and just, yeah. get, just get the Outer Worlds finished get it out the door start working on our stuff now please you know totally yeah i didn't know as well the way that it was looking with the kids is that i didn't know if this was going to be like team based as well which i'm also slightly skeptical yeah. about. i mean you would assume that you can play it solo but it does look like it will be a co-op online game like that that possibility will be there and there's did like, it look like that to you as yeah because well? i don't know if that was just me because there was like, not read that anywhere no just the way it looked there was like building mechanics and stuff in it as well though right like yeah very yeah. like fortnite looking kind of no it wasn't not quite fortnite, not not like maybe. towers like that but just the way it looks on the screen as it's being built like i don't know like i can see that they might be looking at mechanics to use maybe even in future like uh, outer worlds games where you start to kind of expand on the mechanics that are in that, and this is a trial run. That sounds like going down the Fallout 4 road. It does, yeah, do it does, like right? Fallout 4 but road list. That's, that is the road in front of them <laughs> in, in all likelihood. So we're probably looking at like a co-op survival game here, presumably that you can play either solo or like you don't have to have like a clan necessarily. But yeah, it's not it's not that far away if they're saying it's coming out in spring, so we should know more about it in the next this, couple of this months. This cannot be a big... No. Deal. This can't no. be their next main game. Absolutely not, no. I don't know, I feel, I feel as if you're wasting... I don't want to say you're wasting their talents. That's not really what I mean, but that's not what I would have chose for them to start making. Mm. Maybe this idea came from Obsidian. I mean, I'm sure it probably did, to be honest with you. Anyway, the next game up was Tell Me Why, this by Don't Nod of Life is Strange fame. It's another story-driven uh, adventure game. This one will be three episodes. I think the other Life is Strange games have been, what, like, like five, five or six? Five-ish. Yeah, yeah. So slightly smaller title for them. The game follows two twins, one of which is a trans male, and they've worked very closely with the GLAD organization, the LGBTQ advocate organization, to make sure that they have portrayed a trans man correctly. And this will be the first trans character that's uh, playable from a major studio, which I think is pretty cool. This will also be uh, an Xbox console exclusive, which is interesting, I think, yeah, because they have not been bought by Xbox yet. (laughs) <laughs> well yeah maybe, maybe it's a precursor uh, yeah because yeah. they've, they've been on the rampage with old purchases recently this would be another good get for them something that i was thinking about they've already announced a game called twin mirror they announced it absolutely ages ago oh yeah <laughs> remember that i do remember that i was thinking like because i like, don't know what's happened to that is that coming out after this now is that just being totally put on the back burner because xbox have played for an exclusive well, maybe so, yeah. I mean, yeah, that advertised as a 2020 game originally, so like presumably both are still coming next year. The thing to say about this, so as you said, it's a smaller title, there's only three episodes, and they have said that all three will come out in the summer next year, which is, I think is quite a smart move to release things like these episodic games, hold them back until they're actually ready, and then release them almost like a TV show gets released. Well, that's, that's not really the point on it, though, is it? I mean, you're supposed to release one, and then the people buying the first episode is supposed to fuel the rest of the game. Yeah, you but know what I mean? does that work? I mean, we I mean, no, both ignored Life is Strange until you might story, as, you know? but no i mean well i don't think that i think that it worked for a time i mm. think it was quite novel for a time yeah. uh, when telltale was doing it when life is the first life is strange came out for example i don't think that now people are overly interested in that no. therefore if you're going to wait and release them all quite shortly like a week after one another say then why not just release it all at the one time i mean yeah i think if you're doing it that closely like i was imagining it probably like june july august so you get well, time e- to play even each there, episode even there I, th- I, d- I think it's an experiment worth trying it's kind of the same as like the dark pictures anthology like obviously they're a bit further apart those releases but it's like a way to keep people in a franchise it's not just a one and done like i've played it all the way through i'll never think about it ever again particularly with these really like narrative driven games where there's not necessarily often a lot of reason to go back unless it has like branching decision trees but yeah this one sounds cool like it will be interesting that since you brought up twin mirror like that they're doing two probably fairly similar games within a year we'll see how that goes but like you say it's a good get for xbox if they are getting don't nod on any sort of exclusivity deal that's that's really interesting yeah definitely next up was everwild by rare 
Rare famous for basically everything that Nintendo did in the <laughs> 90s, as well as uh, Goldeneye and uh, Donkey Kong Country and uh, everything. everything. Sea of Thieves more recently. Sea of Thieves yeah. more recently, yeah. that's a good call, yes, but uh, they are one of the m- most respected studios ever, potentially. Mm-hmm. And they've announced a new game called Everwild. This one was, there was not much detail in this at all. It seemed to be very involved in nature Mm -hmm. it seemed as if you were playing as like a band of characters as well it looked very very indie is what I would yeah, say, yeah, yeah, for yeah. a studio that is used to making the biggest games on consoles, mm-hmm. you know? I don't know, what were your what were your thoughts on this? Kind of the same, like, there's nothing, the trailer is giving you nothing other than a general sense of the setting, so this game could be anything from a, a survival sim to just, like, a, a walking game, you know? Like, it does seem to be sort of squad-based or, or co-op. Yeah, I thought it looked nice, like, I know what you're saying. It, it does, it looks stunning. Yeah. It, it looks, again, it looks like an indie game, I mm-hmm. would say. Yeah. In fact, do you know what it kind of looks like? It looks a bit like Breath of the Wild, but almost a wee bit more colourful. It's definitely smaller in scope than that. I would know. I would imagine yeah. anything is going to be as big as that. Uh, Although I haven't said that. I mean, Microsoft have got the money. It maybe is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, th- I guess just want to watch. They give us no sense of when this is due or anything. I don't think no, they so. Did not. It's probably a while off. But I mean, Sea Thieves really kind of failed to set the heather alight. I don't know, man. It, Gradually, it, it came, yeah. When it came out, its launch wasn't brilliant. Its no, launch wasn't, it wasn't. brilliant. Let's be, <laughs> let's be honest. But. Since then, I don't know, man. It's it's definitely got its fans out there. Yeah, you know? it's got its fans absolutely. So and so, as you were saying, Rare are trustworthy for sure from their history. But I wouldn't like to say what this game is going to be or how good it might be at this point because it could go either way. I mean, this could be a service game as well for all we know at the moment. So interesting, but yeah, not a. It's not like really turning me on so far. But no, yeah. but it's caught my. Eye. It's definitely one of these things that I want to keep an good, eye good, on. Good, you know. Yeah. All right, just some of the other announcements from XO19. Final Fantasy, all of them basically will be coming to Game Pass. Um, so 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 to 12, all three 13s, 15 and eventually 14 apparently will be coming to Game Pass along with my friend Pedro at The Witcher 3, Age of Empires 2 and Rage 2. So lots of lots of stuff coming to Game Pass. That is continuing to be an incredible value for money service that Xbox are given absolutely spectacular if you have an xbox and you do not have games pass i have no idea what you're doing it's crazy <laughs> uh, good like it's hard to imagine someone in that situation now isn't it well all my friends who have xboxes i don't think any of them have it really and i don't know why it's bizarre obviously i aren't listening to the show enough <laughs> yeah listen to me <laughs> um also coming to xbox is the yakuza series finally um yakuza zero y- yakuza kiwami one yakuza kiwami two will be coming to games pass in early 2020 the kingdom hearts games the original ones will also be coming to xbox one kingdom hearts 1.5 2.5 and 2.8 that numbering system is even worse than final fantasies <laughs> uh halo reach will be coming to the master chief collection as well this on console and pc this will be coming december the third which is i mean the master chief collection is getting pretty damn good value for money as well Wasteland 3 will be available on May the 19th, 2020. Although the developer in exile has been purchased by Xbox, this is kind of similar to Obsidian and their worlds, that will still be coming to PS4, Mac and Linux. Speaking of Sea of Thieves, the next big update for that is coming on November the 20th. It's called The Seabound Soul and will have a new tall tale quest and new ammunition type, which is fire bombs, which sounds cool. <laughs> There was also a trailer for a new game called West of Dead, which is a twin sticks top down shooter. It looks a wee bit roguelike from the kind of isometric view, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I'm not entirely sure that it is. Uh, currently, it's got an open beta running through November the 25th. I'd be interested to see if anyone has played that and what the feedback is, because I actually thought that looked quite cool. Yeah, it was a really nice trailer. It starred in Ron Perlman, who was Hellboy, among many other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and this guy looks like uh, Ghost Rider. It does look very much <laughs> like, uh, yeah, sort of like a Ghost Rider set in a cel-shaded Wild West. Um, yep, that yeah. yep, had the nail on the head. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I, I agree. Like, out of all the trailers they gave us here, like this was one of the most interesting I thought um, definitely be interested to see what comes out of that beta Bleeding Edge will also be available on March the 24th 2020 which seems to be a kind of multiplayer combat game kind of like a almost like a 3D version of Smash Brothers I'll be very interested to see how that game plays and what mm. the feedback of that game is because 
right now, I'm not feeling great about it. I'm not going to lie to you. Nah, this, the new cinematic that they released for it, I thought was kind of boring. It, it's got, it feels so much like Overwatch. Like it just feels like they've taken the kind of vibe of Overwatch and pasted it on top of a, a different game style. So we'll see. Like it could be a bit of a misstep from Ninja Theory, but who knows? It feels like something to me from that trailer that they are going to want to support for a while. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a service game. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely, I mean, they need to. Yeah, they, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like they, they're they going to have to build it. Just Absolutely. like in comparison to Hellblade, which felt like some that absolutely deserved the time and more time possibly for development like this one's going to get it long term you know yeah and finally there are more features coming to project x cloud devil may cry 5 nfl 20 and tekken 7 and many more games are going to be added to the streaming service which is currently in quotes public preview which is other words for a beta and next year it will be launching on Windows 10 um, and will support more controllers, including the DualShock 4. Very nice. Yeah. If only some other streaming services had launched them better. <laughs> Which brings us on to news item number two. Very nice. Very Thanks. nicely done. Thanks. <laughs> Stadia has launched, Lewis. Stadia has launched without a lot of its features. And to uh, I've actually written down here lukewarm reception, but I think that's doing it too many favors because mm. it's not been it's not been lukewarm. It's been pretty bad. Yeah, a lot of negativity out there towards it. I mean, and which there was before launch anyway. But yeah, absolutely stripped of features. Yeah, so it doesn't have Stream Connect. It doesn't have State Share. It doesn't have Crowd Play. It doesn't have its achievement system in place. It isn't available on existing Chromecast Ultras. It's only available on the one that they will give you with your Founders Edition because the firmware hasn't been updated yet. Uh, Family sharing isn't available yet. The Buddy Pass, which was I thought was actually a really good idea, which came along with the Founders Edition, which allowed you to give a friend, a, I think it was a three-month free trial or something like that of Stadia Pro isn't available and the controller as well we know the problems with that you won't be able to play wirelessly with anything else apart from the Chromecast Ultra which they have given you and the Bluetooth isn't working yet and just altogether not a great launch we also spoke last week about the games at launch which were also not great Mm -hmm. again I would say that there are some absolutely brilliant games in there that you have almost certainly played Mm -hmm. some of those games are good but all of those games are old apart from guilt basically basically, (laughs) yeah they they did they sort of freaked out just before launch and added another 10 which I think included I think Borderlands is one of them yeah and like Football Manager 2020 is on it now and stuff as well but like you say they're either games that you could play probably for less money on a system that you already own with Without any potential for latency issues. Yeah, well, well, the thing is, is that going into the technical stuff, latency doesn't seem to be as big a problem as people perhaps feared that it might be. Yeah. The tech seems to basically work, although it does seem to be dependent on your internet as to how good it looks mm-hmm. on on your screen, you know what I mean? And if you're using it on a phone, say, or a tablet, then the chances are it's going to look better if you're trying to play it on your big TV or whatever as well, you know? What to do with the hardware as well, the controller that you get seems to be good it seems good like passable yeah yeah yeah. passable but and i've heard this or read this even on multiple sites that it's not as good as either the xbox controller or the the playstation controller which it's supposed to be competing with and they're about to launch two new controllers one of which might come up in a later news item (laughs) list but i mean that's so important because like state at the moment stadia simply is that controller because there is no box and it's only connecting up to this Chromecast. Yeah, that is... Like, this controller symbol, is yeah. it. And if it's not actually even as good as what's out there, what does that say to you, you know? Yeah, as well, just looking at images from, like, social media as well. So I'm conscious of, and you should be conscious of as well, dear listener, that a lot of these people reviewing Stadia will be on very good internet connections. Lots of them will be in places like San Francisco or New York and things like that, which have incredibly good internet compared to other parts of even America or the rest of the world. You know, and it might not be the same for you, basically. And looking on social media, it seems as though comparing images from Xbox or PlayStation or, well, PC will be miles ahead, but comparing Xbox or PlayStation images to images of the same game, whether it be Red Dead or Mortal Kombat or whatever, they just don't look as good. I mean, at the end of the day, that that is it. They yeah. just don't look as good. And basically, I think that everyone should be thinking right now, Oh, it's in beta. Similar to Project X Cloud, it's in public preview or whatever. You know what I mean? No one's under any impressions that Project X Cloud is out, but Google have made it impossible for us to think anything else because everything that they have told us is that this is out and it's ready to go and it's ready to play. And although that might be technically true, they're not giving you a good enough experience for anyone to be excited about this. 
and they've really fumbled this. Yeah, they've badly, m- massively fumbled it. That, that's the key point. Like, there's enough goodwill around Xbox and XCloud and all of that that they can get some leeway if it doesn't go right straight away. But Google, they're entering this space. They made huge claims about their ability to disrupt the gaming space. And they haven't here. Like, they've really dropped the ball a bit. So unless they make major changes quite quickly or by the time it comes to the wider public, it's been tweaked and refined and there are some better and more interesting games on there. I just, I don't see it surviving really. Based on this launch alone, I mean, I know it's early days. I mean, I don't know. I think that they would be so daft to let this go. I think that this model that they have went after, e.g. you will have to buy this Founders Pack and the games on top of that and the subscription service will eventually come on top of that. Who wants that? I don't really think anyone wants that. What people do want is the Netflix of games. That's what people want. They want to pay one price every month and they get all the big titles straight to their TV or their phone or their tablet or wherever the hell they want to play it. That's what they want. And Google has the power to do that and they've kind of not. Yeah. And I don't really know why. Maybe that's maybe that isn't a viable service. I, I don't really know, but that's what everyone expects the streaming future to be. And the first person to pull that off is going to win in a big way. And that could have been Google. And it's not. No, certainly not at this point. It's not, no. All right, moving on to news item number three. Speaking of streaming services, Lewis, <laughs> the PS4 Remote Play has expanded on the very day that Stadia launched. <laughs> Power move from Sony. Yeah, but, well, <laughs> mm, is it though? Uh, yeah, so it basically you can now pay, play PS4 Remote Play on anything you like, basically. So Android phones and tablets, iOS phones and tablets, Windows, Mac whatever i don't know why playstation don't shout about these things more yes they launched this on the same day as stadia to maybe i don't know get a bit of the press themselves but basically it's been entirely buried by the fact that stadia has launched today Mm. good or bad all the chat is around stadia it's not around this similarly with uh, playstation now when they were kind of revamping that and they were cutting prices in half they they kind of just released a, a wee video and went yep this is a thing we're doing now and we we done a wee blog post and that was that <laughs> see you later guys and I'm just gonna like why like Xbox is holding conferences screaming from the rooftops about their streaming services and uh, Games Pass why why aren't you doing this I don't understand. It's, it's slightly baffling. The thing that I can't get my head around the most is that, like, when they relaunched PlayStation Now, and to be fair to them, like, that has become, like, a major, like, cinema advert and all that kind of stuff. Like, they've, they've gone fairly heavy on that, but whether that translates or not, it's a different thing. But, like, this announcement should have been part of that. They should have been like, here's PlayStation Now, you can stream all these games, all the PlayStation back catalogue you could ever dream of, and also, now you can play it on your phone with your DualShock 4. All of that put together starts to look like a really good package. It's weird that they're splitting it up and announcing things at different points. Yeah, it's- I- it's not good it's not been handled well at all not super well and i do think as much as i'm joking there like power move from them i can imagine that their marketing team might have been like a a bit like when they went toe-to-toe with xbox at the start of this generation and did those hilarious videos where they were like handing over games to yeah this is how you borrow a game yeah i can imagine they might just think we'll quietly slate this video that shows you how playing games on multiple different devices can and should work uh, on the same day that stadia completely fails to do so but like you say, like it's not the klaxons are going off. Here's Sony's new big thing, and it's not really been that. Like no, it's well, it's an expansion of an existing service that didn't really work when it launched, yeah. and only kind of works now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, by all accounts, this new thing is is working. I was reading a Kotaku article. I'm going to try it out. Actually. Yeah, I would I, like to see it. I yeah. am going to try it out. I've never tried it before, and I would quite like to try it out again. Me and you are both on OG PS4s. So it'll be very interesting to see how that goes on what I would describe as mediocre internet. Yeah, pretty so. <laughs> I've got, I think it might, and it's probably worse than yours as well. So I doubt it will work. But. Oh, I pay a lot of money for incredibly mm. average internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, a little bit more news uh, coming out of PlayStation. I suppose this is news item kind of three point two. I guess Sony has filed a patent in Japan for a PS5 controller, uh, the DualShock Five, which looks. St- Staggeringly similar to the DualShock 4. Did you see this? Yeah, Did you see the, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it looks, if someone told you it was a DualShock 4, you would not question it. It's not to say that the product will end up necessarily looking like this just because the, the patent's been filed. Although, to be honest with you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it will have, or it seems it will have 
slightly larger triggers, it will have slightly shorter joysticks, it will have a USB-C port, which we already knew, which is a damn good thing, and it will have no light bar, which is superb for battery life and not good for PSVR. Oh god, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because PSVR, so far as I understand, I'm I'm not big up on PSVR, but it uses that light to track the controllers. Mm. So PlayStation have already said that PSVR will be compatible with PS5, but they've sent out a controller which doesn't have a light bar on it. So I don't know if you're then expected to use your PS4 controllers. Is that is that again assuming that the PS4 controller is backwards compatible with the PS5? I'm not sure if they've said that yet. I don't know I mean, if they, that, yeah. that is the speculation. Yeah. But if you're saying that PSVR is going to be compatible with it, then either your PS5 controller also has to be compatible with it, or you have to make the PS the PS4 controller backwards compatible. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see that happen. I think that that that's fair enough that the PS4, or the DualShock 4, should be compatible. Who knows? Like maybe there's some other bit of kit within this new con- controller that can be tracked by PSVR. I don't like you said. Well, the thing is, is that it's visual. Yeah, so that, it literally the point is it. following the light. It's literally yeah. follow. As far as I understand, it, it is literally following the light. Well, that is quite strange then that they've yeah. taken it out. But, but it's but. going to save battery <laughs> yeah. life less. Which is the for main those thing. of us who don't have PS. VR and quite frankly aren't going to get it anytime soon yeah that is a godsend because that drains the battery on those controllers something awful they have such bad battery life see if this can even even if it just goes up by like three or four hours i would be so happy <laughs> so happy i'm not a difficult man to please loose i'm not a difficult man to please three or four hours would be more than enough for me but with any luck it'll like triple it and it'll last like a week <laughs> <laughs> you're dreaming by it all right, and news item number four. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order loose. It has come out and it has been well received. Hurrah. <laughs> Breathe easy, <everyone>. Hurrah. <laughs> it's a good Star Wars game. It's a good Star Wars game. It's currently sitting with an 85 on Metacritic for PC, an 82 on Metacritic for Xbox, an 81 on Metacritic for PS4. Don't be a slave to that Metacritic, as always, but those are... Damn respectable scores. Yeah. Uh, it seems that the story is actually getting real praise. I've heard more than one person say that this is one of the better Star Wars stories ever told, mm. which is very interesting. It seems that the mechanics are also good, uh, specifically the lightsaber. The lightsaber feels good. These kind of Dark Soul-esque combat mechanics that they've built around that feel really good, work really well within that universe. And the fact that it's kind of all about being defensive and looking for your opportunity yeah. you know rather than just going in there like a space ninja <laughs> uh, where it does seem to fall down are on like technical issues which which is disappointing it does seem as if maybe this was getting pushed out the door a wee bit quicker than it uh, might have needed to be yeah. n- needed to be i'm sure that came because of pressure from ea and disney i would have thought to get it out before yeah uh, skywalker yeah yeah exactly However, despite that, it seems to be reviewed really well. Some of the other criticisms of the game are that there does seem to be a bit of kind of dodgy level design here and there. Some of the platforming elements that were kind of akin to Uncharted aren't maybe as good. Or some of the windows to do what you're supposed to be doing are like incredibly small <laughs> and a bit bullshit, to be honest. Yeah. I was just watching like a, a stream of one of them, just like a let's play, and it was just this guy missing this rope like three times in a row. And it was just like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Like, just, like, <laughs> leaping off to catch yeah, yeah, a rope yeah. kind of thing. And, oh, and, and just missed it. Yeah. And just missed it for no real reason. <laughs> That's frustrating. Yeah, it, like, I, think it is, I think it's things like that. I think it is just a bit frustrating. It wouldn't ruin your experience of no. the game, but perhaps a bit more annoying than it needed to be. Yeah. Perhaps you could have used a wee bit more polish than it got. Well, and presumably EA can like push out some patches to deal with some of the technical stuff. I mean, I, no, oh, I, yeah, I'm sure. no idea I'm sure. some of those I'm hitboxes sure. and stuff could be changed. I've got, say, like I was watching IGN's video review just last night and yeah, some of those more Uncharted sequences, uh, they were much bigger and seemed to be a much bigger part of the game than I was necessarily expecting. And from that piece of footage like i thought they looked really good fun but i can see from watching it that there's bits of like at one point i've thought of celeste just the way that cal was like bouncing around between different surfaces to reach a platform eventually yeah i was like god that so looks it, like it I has timing the, the you know tight timing yeah. on those can be a bit bullshit it yeah seems from time to time but ultimately it's a good star wars game yeah it's ultimately game, yeah. it's a good star wars game that I'm very excited to play at some point. Definitely. And I think I have got at least three games I need to play before <laughs> yeah. that, but I'm very excited to get it played at some point. Yeah, it's definitely on my list for the next few months. And I just think, like, for someone like myself who's never got massively invested in any of the Souls games, I think you're the same. You played a bit of Bloodborne. Yeah, um, definitely. Sekiro as well. But yeah, and Sekiro too. But, like, this looks to me a bit like just a, an entryway into that style of game if you're not used to the difficulty levels and the kind of the way that you can be set back 
by getting defeated by enemies or you know, losing your progress, having to go back and like reclaim your XP and stuff like that. It seems like it's got a lot of those Souls esque mechanics just dialed down slightly, which I am like totally fine with. <laughs> <laughs> just, just as a way to kind of get into the rhythm of it, you know. Souls games can feel so daunting. No, absolutely. And what is EA without respawn these days? Oh, honestly, a bunch, on his arse. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of microtransaction laden sports games mm. and respawn. Mm. That is what they are these days. Hell of a job they're doing. Hell of a job. Hell of a job. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. All right, just finishing off with a couple of shout outs. Shenmue 3 Lewis is finally out. 18 years in the making and it's finally here. And it seems to be exactly more Shenmue. If that is what you want, it seems to be exactly that and no more. If it's not for you, it probably isn't going to be for you because it looks like an 18 year old game, if I'm totally honest with you. It looks like a nicely polished 18 year old game. Yeah. I mean, I just like a huge congratulations to those fans who've helped make that game happen. Like, they're such a community. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. Yeah. It, is, it is a hell of a story. Yeah. It is a tremendous, tremendous story of how yeah. that game got made and how the fans had such love for it that they essentially willed it into existence. Yeah, demanded it for years and years. And, and No, a fa- fantastic story. It's totally not for me. I'm, no. I'm not going to lie. I have. <laughs> no interest whatsoever in playing it to be frank despite the fact that i'll probably have to play it the first two to even no, broach the on, third yeah. one but fantastic for those fans and fantastic for those people who kickstarted it and whatever it's, it really is it's a fantastic story all right shout out number two football manager 2020 has come out i was reading an ign review of this actually it was glowing just about it Although it seems to be basically more of the same, uh, it seems that the series is in a really good place. It seems as if they're making this latest Football Manager a bit easier for someone like me or you to come back to the series or for people who are just new to the series not to be overwhelmed by the systems on systems on systems on systems. Currently sitting at an 85 on Metacritic. Don't be a slave to that Metacritic, but again, damn good score. Yeah, I have no idea how that compares to previous games, but yeah, only hearing good noises about this. You can't really go too wrong with a Football Manager game, right? You can't, you can't. Shout out number three, Half-Life Lewis. Dun, dun, dun. We're getting a new one. It's called Half-Life Alex, and it'll be a VR title. The crowd groaned. Yeah. It seems as though you're going to play as the NPC Alex from Half-Life 2. Is this going to be the fabled Half-Life 3? Almost certainly not, but we're going to get more details on Thursday the 21st, which will be the day this podcast comes out, ladies and gentlemen. So you will know more about it than we do. (laughs) Uh, Right now, all we know is that there will be an announcement, basically. But Half-Life 3, I highly doubt it. It's absolutely not, no. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, guys. Yeah, just one final shout out. Amy Hennig of Uncharted fame has joined Skydance Media to launch a new game studio for story-based games. Now, obviously, this is very, very early days. If she's gone there to build a new studio, effectively, there will be some time down the line before we see anything at all. But it's quite exciting to know that we might get a new Amy Hennig game next gen. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, that would be really cool. This is the kind of thing that Stadia should have done, really. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I never even thought of that. Yeah, why isn't she working for Stadia? Why isn't she creating some original game for as a Stadia? Ex- oh, God. Oh, good God, I'm so stupid. <laughs> Do you know what's not stupid, Lewis? Beer. And that's what we're going to have. And we'll be back for Topic of the Week. <laughs> and we are back with Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is the Game Award nominees, Lewis. It is the season... Tis the season for Game of the Year. We're finally here, yeah. We are finally here. So basically, the the Game of the Year award nominees have all been voted on and are now official uh, for further voting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's open to the public now. To it's, it's, now it's now open to... No, um, but the industry vote on it as well, don't they? So it's uh, kind of... I'm yeah. not quite sure what the split is there, but yeah, the public also do get to vote on them. Worth clearing up right away that Pokemon and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order have just, just missed the window to be included in this year's awards. And Smash Brothers Ultimate, which actually came out in December last year, is included in this year's awards, which is all a bit annoying, really. <laughs> it's a shame for Pokemon and Star Wars, but these that's just what happens, you know? Well, considering next year they're going to be going up against Cyberpunk, Final Fantasy VII Remake, Last of Us 2, and Watch Dogs Legion, so they'll have very little hope of doing very much of anything <laughs> next year, I would have thought. <laughs> I've kind of forgotten how good this year was. (laughs) (laughs) It feels a lot more varied, I guess. There's a lot more, like last year, it was like God of War or Red Dead for every category, whereas here there's quite a lot to choose from. So let's dive in. Let's see. Let's do it. First off, Lewis, the big one, the daddy game of the year. So this is for recognizing a game that delivers the absolute best experience across all creative and technical fields. The nominees for this one are Control, Death Stranding, Resident Evil 2 Remake, 
Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate, and The Outer Worlds. Thoughts? Anything missing? I mean, there's so, I guess there's some games that probably would have you'd imagine that they would be in there, but this seems like the strongest kind of lineup. Um, I don't know what about you? Like, what do you think is missing from that? Honestly, not much. Mm. I think that that is probably about right. I think you could make a case for Apex Legends. Mm-hmm. I think you can make a case for Link's Awakening remake. I think you can make a case for The Outer Wilds. Definitely, yeah. But I think that in reality, that is probably about right. Yeah, I think your winner is coming from that selection anyway. I would agree. What is your game of the year out of that, do you think? Oh, Death Stranding feels like the obvious contender to me still. I totally get its divisiveness. I haven't necessarily played enough of The Outer Worlds to put it there, although you did last week, so... Maybe I can't see Smash winning at all. Honestly, I still think that the the most enjoyable game of this year is Resident Evil 2. I, really? I, Would you still give it to Resident of, Evil 2? Of those, like right now, like I think Death Stranding, going on all creative and technical fields, probably edges it. I just haven't played it all the way through yet. But in terms of just like the game out of those up till now that I've definitely enjoyed the most, it's probably Resident Evil 2. I mean, I actually probably enjoyed Smash more, right? But I just don't think you can give it to that necessarily. Nah. I think that there's a serious case. Now, again, I have not played enough of the game either, but I think that someone with more knowledge than me could make a very good case of why Sekiro should win this yep, category. Totally. And if, I think if it did, I would I would be completely comfortable with that as an idea. But yeah, just just haven't touched that enough. So yeah. So what do I think will win? I mean, it, it probably is honestly between Death Stranding and Resident Evil Two Remake, isn't it? it is. I would have thought so. Just based on the kinds of people who are voting for these as well. Yeah. Like Red Dead ended up losing out in certain fields last year, partly because God of War was also phenomenal. But, yeah, yeah. But because there was a divide in the community over it, and I just don't think for the people who are into Sekiro, there isn't really a divide there, and the people that are into Resident Evil Two, there's just no divide there at all. Like everyone agrees that's a solid game. So yeah. It's a shame to see like there are worlds which we've not even discussed as just an absolutely superb game. I would totally have it in this category, but in reality, I would say that there's at least three games being Death Stranding, Resident Evil 2 Remake, and Second World are technically better than it, even if I enjoyed it more yeah. than all of them. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. So I think Death Stranding will probably win that. Do you want to take bets on this? Uh, what are we betting? I don't know. We'll decide later. <laughs> okay. I mean, I would probably take Death Stranding for that as okay, well. Okay, I'll so. take Death Stranding as well. Okay, that's the total wash. <laughs> there we go. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, next one up is Action Game. So this is for the best game and the action genre focused primarily on combat. And I guess that's the key part here, really. Yeah, and the nominees for this are Apex Legends, Astral Chain, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Devil May Cry 5, Gears 5, and Metro Exodus. Thoughts? Uh, well, we both, as far as I can tell, hated Devil May Cry 5. Or not hated, hated it, maybe not strong. hated it. But hated is strong. No, I, I'm not a fan of Devil May Cry yeah. series in the slightest. Despite the fact that I love Platinum games, which are basically rip-offs yeah. of Devil May Cry games, I would love to see Astral Chain win that, again, just because it is a Platinum mm-hmm. game. I think that this this category, sorry, is really between Apex Legends and Call of Duty Modern Warfare. You think so? I, I would have put Gears up there as well. Like, I think there's enough of a kind of fan base for this this Gears, Gears game in particular. Yeah, 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 maybe. Honestly, I think Apex, I'd kind of forgotten that Apex was this year. Like, it feels, yeah, March, like, March it something feels like it's been out for so long. I would quite like it to go to Apex. Gears seems like a worthy winner to me as well, but like Astral Chain, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, agreed. What what are you calling? Um I'm going I'm gonna give it to Gears. You're gonna give it to Gears? Yeah. Bold, I'm gonna give it to I'm gonna give it to Apex. Okay, next up, action adventure game. So this is for the best action adventure game combining combat with traversal and puzzle solving. Nominations for this are Borderlands 3, Control, Death Stranding, Resident Evil 2 Remake, Link's Awakening Remake, and Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Yeah, I fucking loved Link's Awakening, and I'm so glad that it got the nod there, given that it didn't get a nod for Game of the Year. Death Stranding's interesting in this category. Yeah. Action. There, like, there is... Adventure, a- yes. Tr- Action? Th- Award-worthy? <laughs> Maybe not. I think this is the only one Control's got a chance of winning. Maybe. Because Maybe. the combat Maybe. in Control was so fucking fun. I absolutely <laughs> loved it. I really, really did. I would struggle to call Resident Evil 2 an adventure game. Again, combining combat with traversal and puzzle solving. Traversal yeah. maybe less so, but yeah. combat and puzzle solving, it's it's got, you know. Honestly, I think winner, hands down, Sekiro. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think that this will win, but it's what I want to win, and I'll put the money there, and that's Link's Awakening. Fair enough. Next one up is Art Direction. For outstanding creative and our technical achievement in artistic design and animation. Nominees for this one are Control, Death Stranding, Grease, Cyanar Wild Hearts, Sekiro and Link's Awakening. 
Again, that Link's Awakening art style is Again, super. I, I said this about Control the last time, and I'm going to say this about Link's Awakening this time. I think this is the only one that has got a hope of winning. Um, I would put them the other way around. I think, actually, I could see Control scooping art direction just for being something quite unusual in this space. But It was, I mean, it does actually mention technical achievements there. And Control was a fantastic technical achievement in that it was one of the first games to use ray tracing in the ways that it was, yeah. and it being such a, a prominent feature of the game mm-hmm. it did not run well on consoles yeah i mean some superb games here like the style in greece and uh cyanara wild hearts is you know really special yeah i just don't know that it's like that either of those games feels different enough or really pushing boundaries in a way that other indie games have in the past in terms of their yeah. direction i mean i would fucking love to see any of the two of them one yeah. to be honest with you just because i just because i want indie games to win as many categories <laughs> as possible uh, but not just that i mean uh, devolver who published greece and anna partner who published sayonara wild hearts are two of the best indie game publishers out there as far as i'm definitely, concerned and definitely the more the the more awards they get the better as far as i'm concerned yeah. um <laughs> However, I'm going to give that one to Link's Awakening, I think. Fair enough, yeah. Control for me, I think, for this one, yeah. Audio design, then. So this is recognising the best in-game audio and sound design. Nominations for this one are Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, Control, Death Stranding, Gears 5, Resident Evil 2, and Sekiro. I feel like I'm quite bad at identifying good audio design in games, so I'm not strong on this category, and also I haven't played Call of Duty or Gears. Um, What I will say as well is that Call of Duty is always a strong contender in these games because because the the sound design involved in the firing guns from various distances away from you, firing your own gun, your footsteps, everyone else's footsteps, Mm -hmm. things exploding at various distances, the, the sound design for games like Call of Duty are incredibly yeah. impressive and actually that would probably be my pick for this I, I can see it winning that as I well I can see yeah. it winning this very strong I mean again I've not played the game but just based on experience of playing other Call of Duties and what I know games like that are like yeah that is my bet for this. Yeah, I'd be fairly confident there. What about Resident Evil 2? Do you have any kind of strong memories of the sound design? No, I am actually quite surprised that it was it was uh, nominated for this. I mean, I don't think I, I mean, don't think the sound design was bad in any capacity, but I don't know. Is it award worthy? Doesn't necessarily stick out. Yeah, no. Uh, s- same with Sekiro as well. Although again, the, the sound design perfectly good. Was there anything that really stood out to me? Not, not from r- what not I played. Really. No, no. Next up is community support. So this is recognising a game for outstanding community support, transparency and responsiveness. Feels like a weird award, this. Yes, it does. First up is Apex Legends. Next is Destiny 2. Then Final Fantasy XIV. Then Fortnite. Then Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. I have no idea, really, because I don't play a lot of games. This is the thing, is that we don't play many service games. I mean, I have played all but Final Fantasy XIV. Mm-hmm. But I've not stuck with the community enough to know how well it's supported. Yeah. I mean, what I will say is that the two games there that got the best support this year are Final Fantasy XIV, which had one of the best updates that it's ever had Mm -hmm. and was massively critically acclaimed. And ditto, basically, for Destiny 2. Yeah. So I would say, personally, it would be between one of them. And I would love it if it were Final Fantasy XIV, but I think the Destiny 2 probably runs up. I think so too. Like, there's that element of the the criteria, community support, transparency, and responsiveness. I feel like we know all the bad stories for community support and transparency and that kind of thing, and not so many of the good ones, but it doesn't feel like there's been any kind of bad blood around Bungie for a while now, certainly since the split from Activision. There's a lot of fan support for them. The new update has gone down really well. feels like they communicate, they listen to what people want, they make changes in the game, so it feels like Destiny 2 is the right pick there. Next up is Family Game. So this is for the best game appropriate for family play, irrespective of genre or platform. First up is Luigi's Mansion 3, then Ring Fit Adventure, Super Mario Maker 2, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and Yoshi's Crafted World. You notice a common thread between these games, Lewis? Nintendo, yeah. Yes, uh, all Nintendo. Absolutely killed it, and four of them from the sort of Mushroom Kingdom family as well, to a certain extent. So yeah, good stuff for Nintendo. Um... The best game. Smash Bros. is a family th- game. That's where I was going there. Like, that is the best game on that list, but it's, yeah. it doesn't. Re- I mean, it is a family game. I suppose it's appropriate enough, but it's not. Is Mario like, Maker 2 a family game? I think it's quite a difficult family game. Like, I can imagine families I mean, playing the, it. The reason why that game is good is because of the insane level design. Yeah. yeah. Which doesn't really translate well to being played well by families. That, insane that I mean, I there mean, may be good levels the, for uh, kids to and me, stuff. Though, I mean, you know? Yoshi's Crafted World was like 
whatever. Yeah. Ring Fit Adventure is kind of good for what it is, but the best game there that is suitable for families to me is Luigi's Mansion 3, and it's not even close. Yeah. And I've I, not even played it. No, I, know, I, I, would, <laughs> I would definitely pick that out of theirs as well. Like, again, I think Super Smash Brothers is probably the better game, but it doesn't feel like it wins there to me. So, yeah, I'd, I'd pump for Luigi's Mansion 3 as well. I kind of hope it does, because I've been singing its praises all year without having played it. <laughs> Next up is Fighting Game. For the best game designed primarily around head-to-head combat, Mark. Nominations for this are... Dead or Alive 6, Jump Force, Mortal Kombat 11, Samurai Showdown, and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. It's got to be smashed. There is only one winner here. It's it's Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Mortal Kombat 11 is an absolutely fantastic game. By all accounts, uh, Samurai Showdown is also very good, although I've not played it. Jump Force was dreadful. And (laughs) Dead or Alive 6 is... Pretty mediocre. It's making up the numbers there, really, isn't it? Uh, uh, um, Yeah, so Smash Bros. Hands down. No competition. Absolutely good. Good stuff. (laughs) Next up, a fresh indie game. Yeah. Fresh indie game brought to you by Subway. <laughs> God. Uh, so recognising a new independent studio that released its first game in 2019, Mark. First up is Za Um for Disco Elysium. Next up is Nomad Studio for Greece. Then Dead Toast Entertainment for my friend Pedro. Then Mobius Digital for The Outer Wilds. Then Mega Crit for Slay the Spire. Then House House for Untitled Goose Game. Now, Liz, you've played far more of those games than I have. Yeah, like that is a cracking list as well. Like it's, Oh, absolutely. And bear in mind, this isn't just best indie game. This is the best indie game that is also that studio's first game. Crucially, it's for the studio who released their first game this year. And I mean, fair play, there are some crackers there. I mean, I think the weakest one there might be my friend Pedro, and I really want to play that exactly, game. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it totally depends for people how they judge this category. To me, having not played all of them, Outer World, eh, sorry, Outer Wilds is a massive, massive standout. Could have easily been in the actual Game of the Year category for me. So I would probably put it there. The noise around Disco Elysium, though, my God, it sounds incredible. incredible. So I would not be stunned if that didn't get it. Are you going out of Wilds? I'm going out of Wilds. But I'm going Disco Elysium. Well, fair, like, there fair enough. Go. Well, that's there the divide there. But just like, <laughs> I, I wee shout out though for House House. Like, Untitled Goose Game isn't the best game this year. It's not the best first game this year. But for a debut studio to have made the impact that they did and get the kind of meme culture going that they did is, I think, really superb. So just a wee well done to them, even if they don't take the award. Next up is Game Direction. Awarded for Outstanding Creative Vision and Innovation in Game Direction and Design. Uh, nominations for this are Control, Death Stranding, Resident Evil 2, Sekiro, and Outer Wilds. I'm going Outer Wilds there. Are you? Yeah. I don't see that there's any way that Hideo Kojima doesn't want this. You think so? <laughs> Basically, yeah. I only say that because Outer Wilds feels like it's doing something completely new with its gameplay. and with as, as opposed to the completely mainstream Death Stranding? No, like, yeah, but it's still just like a massive world traversal, right? Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not putting that down at all. I don't know. Like, it's been so split over how people react to that. And I think Outer Wilds is just this totally unique narrative experience unlike anything else on the market just now that's just my pick like I wouldn't be stunned obviously if Death Stranding wins but I would like that to go air to next up independent game (laughs) for outstanding creative and technical achievement in a game made outside the traditional publisher system first one is Baba Is You next Disco Elysium then Katana Zero Outer Wilds and Untitled Goose Game I mean I mean that's that's pretty good another cracking list yeah. yeah good to see Katana Zero getting a nod there absolutely I would what love I would love it to go to Baba as you. Um I don't think it will. No, I don't think it will either. I suspect probably Outer Wilds as well. Yeah, I'm going Disco Elysium here again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just not sure enough people will have played that yet to have like got the critical mass behind it. But <sighs> Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Like I think the Untitled Goose game has a real, real chance yeah, here as well. Totally, yeah. And Katana Zero, like a lot of people went wild for that. But yeah, I'm sticking with it. Disco Elysium. Alright, cool. Next up, mobile game. For the best game playable on a dedicated mobile device. Nominees are Call of Duty Mobile, Grindstone, Cyanide Wild Hearts, Sky, Children of Light, and What the Golf. If What the Golf doesn't win this, <laughs> that is maybe a table flip moment for me. Yeah. Because it is so unbelievably good. Cyanide Wild Hearts, which I have played a little bit of now, is also great. Sky, which I've also played a little bit of, oh, yeah. is great. Call of Duty Mobile is Call of Duty on a phone, which is a pretty good technical achievement, and I've quite genuinely I've never heard of Grindstone. <laughs> um, but what the golf is so fucking good, yeah. and is so perfect for a mobile phone that it is so far ahead of the rest as far as I'm concerned. A uh, total agreement. Like what the golf is so good. Three out of five of those in Apple Arcade. Good time for mobile games. Next up, multiplayer game. For outstanding online multiplayer gameplay and design, including co-op and massively multiplayer experiences, irrespective of game genre or platform. 
Nominees for this are Apex Legends, Borderlands 3, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, Tetris 99, and Tom Clancy's The Division 2. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got? Probably Apex Legends there. I would also say Apex Legends personally, although I love, love, love that Tetris 99 is there and would actually quite like to see that one. <laughs> but my bet is on Apex Legends personally. Yes. Next up is Narrative. For outstanding storytelling and narrative development in a game. First is A Plague Tale, Innocence, Control, Death Stranding, Disco Elysium, and The Outer Worlds. God, I want to give this to The Outer Worlds. <laughs> I really, really do, but I do not think that's going to win. <laughs> what, what, what are you picking there, then? What do you think? Disco Elysium. You think so, yeah? I, like, the narrative, that is the, that is all the game is, is a big narrative. You know yeah, I mean? well, like, in crazy systems and stuff as well. Exactly, yeah. and it's done in such an interesting way, and so is The Outer Worlds, and I really, mm, maybe I will give it to The Outer Worlds. Will I give it to The Outer Worlds? Because, I mean, the narrative in Death Stranding is just batshit. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I think I'm going to go Outer Worlds here, having not even played it all. I think that that is where this game deserves to take its win. Oh man, it's just what it's like Spider Man last year. I just think it's going to get overlooked, mm. unfortunately. I'm going Disco Elysium. Okay. I'm going for cool. it. Cool, cool, Keep cool. strong with it. Next up is Ongoing Game. Uh, awarded to a game for outstanding development of ongoing content that evolves the player experience over time. First up, Apex Legends again, Destiny 2, Final Fantasy 14, Fortnite, and Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. I think just I, I could see this going anyway though. Yeah, Honestly, I really could. What are you, what are you choosing? I, I think, I, again, I would love to see Final Fantasy. Fourteen <laughs> on this and I really just don't think that I will. Nah, I don't think so either. Um, Apex deserves its nomination. I think it's probably Fortnite's to lose after the whole that yeah. whole black do you know, hole. Do you know moment. what? I mean? Do you know what? I agree. Yeah, I agree. Next up, performance awarded to an individual for voiceover, acting, motion, and or performance capture. First up is Ashley Birch. For Pravati and The Outer Worlds, I'm so, so fucking glad yeah, that that character got nominated. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy about that. Next up is Courtney Hope for Jesse Faden and Control. After that is Laura Bailey for Kate Diaz in Gears 5. After that, Mads Mikkelsen for Clift in Death Stranding. Then Matthew Poretta for Dr. Casper Darling in Control. And Norman Reeves for Sam Porter, Sam Porter Bridges sorry, in Death Stranding. Again, I don't see that there's much of a world in which Norman Reeves doesn't win this. Yeah. However, the guy who played uh, Dr. Darling in Control was absolutely awesome. That, he's my dark horse for, for this. <laughs> so again, like Mads Mikkelsen, from the little snippets of him I've seen so far in Death Stranding, looks like an incredible performance. Feels very inevitable that Norman Reedus will end up on stage at the Game Awards. <laughs> but that performance from Matthew Peretta was fucking brilliant. Oh no, it was. It was absolutely amazing in Control. But Ashley Birch's performance as Pravati. Pravati in The Outer Worlds, oh my god, she's my girl, man. She's, <laughs> she's with me on every fucking mission. I would love, again, I would love to see her win that but I really don't think it's going to happen so what, are you putting it to Norman Reedus Norman Reedus for me cool. yeah. I'm going to take Matthew Pareta just partly out of hope fair enough yeah. fair enough next up role playing game for the best game designed with rich player character customization and progression including massively multiplayer experiences first up Disco Elysium then Final Fantasy 14 Kingdom Hearts 3 Monster Hunter World Iceborne and then The Outer Worlds surely you've got a plump for Disco Elysium again I know I do. I, I do I feel as if I've kind of committed I feel as if I've kind of committed to it but for everything that I've said Disco Elysium to, I also feel very strongly about The Outer Worlds. Yep. I just think that more people are going to vote for that for being very, very innovative, as opposed to voting for The Outer Worlds, which is effectively a rip-off of a Fallout game. Mm. It's amazing. It's so good. But yeah, Disco Elysium for me. Yeah, I'm picking that as well for this category, yeah. Score and music is next. For outstanding music, inclusive of score, original song, and or licensed soundtrack. First up, Cadence of Hyrule, then Death Stranding, Devil May Cry 5, Kingdom Hearts 3, and Sayonara Wild Hearts. I've got to give that to Death Stranding. It's the only game there that I've played or paid attention to the music in. Sayonara Wild Hearts. Are you putting it there? It. I mean, that seems like the only other natural choice, but um, Death Stranding's score, it's like full of actual bands. I can just see that swinging it, you know. Next up, sports slash racing game for the best traditional and non-traditional sports and racing game fair enough it's <laughs> an odd odd description of that first up is crash team racing nitro fueled dirt 2.0 e-football pro evolution soccer 2020 god i hate what they've done i know they do, really deserves to lose just that game. stupid oh, name god, I hate it so much. <laughs> formula 1 2019 and fifa 20 it's got to be CTR, do not it? I, I would have thought so, yeah. I don't know enough about Dirt, to be fair, but FIFA 20 is broken by all accounts, so... Yeah, FIFA 20 was dreadful. Again, those Formula 1 games, man, like, they're really good yeah, for I'm what sure they are. They are for, like, yeah. some racers, they're really good, but more than anything, I just want to see CTR. Definitely, it? yeah. <laughs> Next up, strategy game. Best game focused on real-time or turn-based strategy gameplay, irrespective of platform. 
First up, Age of Wonders, Planetfall, then Anno 1800, Fire Emblem Three Houses, Total War Three Kingdoms, Tropical Six, and Wargroove. It's got to be Fire Emblem, right? God almighty, if it doesn't win again, I'm going to flip a table. It was so good. It was so, so good. However, I think Wargroove's the Dark Horse. Yeah. I'm going to give it to Fire Emblem Three Houses. I would quite like to see Wargroove scoop it, but I do feel a bit bad for Fire Emblem that, they've, that this is the only category they're in as far as I can tell, so yeah. Yeah. It's it's niche. It's a JRPG. I thought that maybe because a lot of Americans vote on this, they might have been more connected to that because they are generally more connected to Japanese games than Europeans. But yeah, it's a shame it's only been nominated in this category, but I hope it wins it. And finally, VR slash AR game. So this is for best game experience playable in virtual or augmented reality, irrespective of platform. First up, it's Asgard's Wrath. Blood and Truth, Beat Saber, No Man's Sky, and Trovert Saves the Universe. For me, there is only one winner here. Which is what? Beat Saber. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, that was like a phenomenon when it came out. Didn't Asgard's Wrath like review really well? Asgard's though, Wrath, yeah, because yeah, we actually brought it up in yeah. this podcast. It was sitting at like a 93 at one point. I think it subsequently came down. I think it ended up in like an 89 or whatever. But still pretty damn Amazing, good. yeah. But I think for the people who are going to be voting on this, Beat Saber, hands down. Maybe so, yeah. I mean, it looks like great fun, yeah. I'm going to put it to Asgard's Wrath just because I feel like you're giving it to Beat Saber. So I'll, Fair take, enough. I'll take that bet. Fair enough, just split it. <laughs> All right. And there's there's also a whole bunch of like esports nominations that, quite frankly, we just don't know enough about to give an opinion. But there's, there's loads and loads of awards coming. Um, go and vote. Go and vote. And yeah. what's your favorite? Yeah. And watch them when they come out. It's, all, it's always a good laugh, I think. Like, always something daft happens and it's it's just good. I just like <laughs> the awards. I just, I just love it. It's like our Oscars, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. Like yeah. our Oscars. So what's that? It's December 12th? Yeah, yeah. yeah December 12th. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a long one. Let's see how the edit goes. It might only be over an hour, maybe quite a lot over an hour. <laughs> I'd like to remind everyone that you can find players too on all the social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P L A Y E R S T O O com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts, we would really, really help us out. If you like anything that you've heard here, Please just give us those five stars. It really, really means a lot. And you'd be an absolute legend to us. And thank you so much to anyone that's already done that for us. I cannot explain enough uh, how helpful that is to us. It really does help. I'd like to remind everyone that our play along game for this month is Limbo. It is a superb, creepy, <laughs> awesome little <laughs> puzzle platformer. Again, you can usually get it for a pretty good prices. Uh, it's often bundled with Inside, which is by the same developer, Playdead. Both games are definitely worth playing, but Limbo is the one that we're focusing on this month, and it's superb. You, you definitely won't regret it. It's, it's critically acclaimed across the board. It's a superb little game. Absolutely superb. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I guess we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.